and I'm now going to introduce uh, our next speaker, who is a man who has spent his life championing open societies and the rules-based order. David Miliband, the son of Jewish refugees, the former British Foreign Secretary, since 2013, the president of the International Rescue Committee, one of the world's premier humanitarian organizations. Hi, uh, Danny. Nice to be with you. It's very nice to see you here. You just heard Mr. Bannon. I saw you there in the front row. A man with a very different worldview to yours. What did you make of it? Well, two things struck me very strongly listening to uh, Mr. Bannon. The first is that he has absolutely no answers to the problems that he rightly identifies with the modern world. And I think we have to take very seriously the grievances, the inequalities, the insecurities to, that he is highlighting and that he is speaking to. And we have to make sure that our answers, our politics of answers, beats his politics of poison and grievance. And so the first plea I would make to people is that we must never allow ourselves, whether we're coming from the center left, which is my position, or the center right, don't let us be lumped together as the defenders of the status quo. The great claim of this so-called populist movement is that it's trying to substitute itself from defenders of the indefensible to actually the attackers and the insurgents, and we shouldn't allow that to happen. But the second thing that uh, struck me listening to Bannon was in the first part of your conversation. And that was when you asked him about European history, about the poisonous history of what happens when leaders blame foreigners for their own problems. And I thought back to the speech that Mr. Bannon made in France in March of this year, when he spoke to the National Front in France, and he told them in words, if they call you xenophobes, if they call you racists, if they call you misogynists, wear that as a quote-unquote badge of honor. And that sent a chill down my spine because of my family history, but also because of the country that I come from. I live and work in New York. I run an NGO that was founded by Albert Einstein. But I know that Albert Einstein was only in New York because the politics of hate in Germany was allowed to creep from the edges, from the margins, to the mainstream of German society and when Hitler was elected in 1933. And I'm very wary of comparisons with the 1930s. I was brought up not to uh, default to that as an argument. But I think one of the lessons is that we should never be complacent about that kind of politics of, and of poison. And so I think that it's very, very important that we sharpen our answers, but that we are also ally it to a passion and a drive to recognize the seriousness of the challenge that exists. Uh, and how serious is it that, how big a risk does this politics of poison a very good phrase, pose. Uh, how serious a risk does the worldview well, that look, Mr. You're Bannon coming, epitomizes well, pose? Look, you, you, you're, 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 coming, you're speaking to someone from a country, you're from the country as well. Um, the politics of Brexit was not exactly the politics of uh, Steve Bannon, but there are some common elements. And you and I know that Brexit threatens to plague the United Kingdom for the next 30 years um, because of the social and economic and political damage it does. Uh, I think it's very interesting, however, in uh, Italy, that the, uh, the League, which was the Northern League, which had a very strong anti-European tint to it, has uh, moved from being an anti-European movement now to being an anti-migrant movement. And the reason is that the European Union remains popular in Italy. And if Mr. Bannon wants to run the next uh, European elections on taking apart European healthcare and copying the brilliance of American healthcare, I think he's gonna get a very, uh, he's gonna get a very, very strong answer. So I think we should take it seriously. The truth is it's fragmenting European politics. It's hitting 15 to 20% in European countries, except for Hungary and Poland. And there's a different story that we can explore if, if you like, because I think in those countries, the attacks not on the so-called administrative state, but the attacks on the free press, the attacks on the independent judiciary are extremely serious and completely contrary to uh, European history as well as Europe's future. But part of what we have to then come up with is the liberal answer, if you will, to the challenges that we face. And, and uh, I, I tried to uh, understand what Mr. Bannon's worldview was in the previous conversation. I think now, though, I want to challenge you on what then do liberal social democrats need to do to restore the faith in, in open markets and free societies? Because clearly there is a problem. Well, look, the, the, first of all, we have to identify the problem and then tackle it. And I think that at the heart of the uh, malaise at the moment is three factors, uh, some of which are within our control. The first is that the economic bargain has broken down. I mean, the rent-seeking of the top 0.1%, 0.1%, top 1%, 
the stagnation of wages in the middle is undoubtedly a major, not just a driver of populism, but it's a fault line in our societies. The bargain on which our economic contract has been based has been broken. Secondly, the cultural contract has been broken as well. And you see that in the debate that's being raised on immigration, but also on uh, other issues. Um, th and we should come to the details of that. The third part, though, uh, I, I confess is a much more difficult one, which is the breakdown in the contract between, if you like, the governors and the governed. The traditional basis of representative politics in which people were elected but also were given the freedom to exercise judgment, that contract has broken down and it's broken down. You're, you're having sessions later about technology and social media and I think there are, there are more fundamental issues there. Just one thing I would like to say, which is that uh, the, the, I'm not an economic determinist, but the current levels of growing inequality, post-crash as well as pre-crash, pre are morally as well as politically indefensible. And this is where actually liberals and social democrats are not actually in the same place. Um, I, I consider myself to be a social democrat. That means I actually believe, yes, that it's important that individuals have freedom from the incursions of the state or the incursions of private interest. But if you're going to give individuals freedom to achieve their full potential, then they need the power of government on their side, not just breaking up monopolies, not just taking on antitrust, but actually building the equality of opportunity that is so uh, vital to a vibrant society. You. And the truth is that the political economy of the center-left needs to be renewed. It's been the historic task of social democrats to rescue capitalism from its own excesses. That's what happened with the New Deal in the 1930s. In many ways, it happened with the war on poverty in the 1960s and 70s. Here, we have to renew our, our political economy in an absolutely fundamental way, both for those who are struggling at the bottom and for those who are in the middle. But what does that translate into? I, mean, I, I, we, uh, we, I think it, tran we look, it translates into higher minimum wages. It translates into a bigger earned income tax credit. It translates into universal health care, which is in Europe, remember, we have universal health care, um, so, so it, it's a different uh, model. I think the difficult questions are around the following. One, how wages go up in the middle in a service economy, because we're not we, we, the truth is the majority of jobs in the future are going to be in the service economy, not in the manuf manufacturing economy. And how do you get wages up in the middle in, a, in that? Secondly, how can you ensure that more employees have more of a stake in the economic future of their own uh, firms. And thirdly, and very difficult, how do you make sure that the, fl the, the benefits of a flexible economy don't become the burdens of an exploitative economy? I, I, those are all very important issues, but you are raising questions yeah, and not I, proposing. Well, look, if I was so smart, I would be in politics. So the, uh, <laughs> um, you know, uh, uh, let, let's get the questions right and let's identify the route forward. You're not, I, I would say you're not going to have an answer. You're not going to, I mean, it's interesting. That Steve Bannon thinks, and this, this should be the news story that goes out today, he thinks that 19th century America was the golden age for the American worker. worker. <laughs> now, never mind the uh, sins of uh, after the Civil War and the, uh, the failures of Reconstruction, but the idea that 19th century American workers, without trade unions, without support, were really the, uh, represents the uh, high point of our aspirations, I think is really something that needs to be challenged uh, very, very fundamentally. And I think that we are, we've got different national um, issues. The, 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 look, Britain and America have got high employment, many continental European countries, and, and the issue is wages. Many European economies have high unemployment, and so the issue is how do you get them into work. So there's going to be national particularity uh, about it, but I think that the, uh, the answer to this is to, make, is to reclaim the economic ground. And, y you know, y y I mentioned the cultural contract. This idea that uh, those of us who run NGOs or who sit on, the, who, who, who admire the economies, the idea that we are in favor of unlimited illegal immigration is a complete okay. lie. And no one has ever stood on a platform for unlimited illegal immigration. Actually, uh, you've not had a immigration bill in this country since 1986 that's got through, and it's been blocked not by the left, but actually by the right. So it's important to take, take it on, I think. Uh, the other area that I think it would be very interesting to hear your reaction to, but also where your uh, ideas are, is it refu the whole question of refugees. Because you run one of the biggest agencies that deals with the refugees, uh, clearly underpinning uh, Mr. Bannon's worldview is in the European context, a sense, as, as you know, Viktor Orban sees this, as you know, Muslim invaders. What do you think? I mean, the, the the international refugee system is facing considerable challenges. We're going to see more pressure on refugees. How do you fix it? Well, look, the, the real crisis is a crisis of civil wars around the world. 
we should be asking why are there 25 million people displaced by conflict and violence by unresolved wars, whether in Yemen or in South Sudan or in uh, Syria. So there's a crisis of diplomacy, which is my old uh, business as, as foreign minister. Um, in respect of refugees, look, for centuries, refugees had no rights and were stateless. And after the Second World War, because of the trauma of the Second World War, those people who are, for whom it's not safe to go home were given rights, and states were given responsibilities to shield them. The idea that it's the inventors of that system, the, the Western world that created rights for refugees, that is rolling back those rights, and the gentleman who mentioned the, um, uh, the separation of families at the border was absolutely right uh, to do so. Uh, the idea that it's the countries that wrote the UN Charter that are now running away from its basic norms is an absolute disgrace. But it also raises a wider point, which I, I hope we get a chance to, to have a word about. Um, it's true that Mr. Bannon wants to roll back the rights of the, of the refugees, but he also wants, sees that as part of a wider rollback of international cooperation. Now, what's the truth about the refugee crisis or the economic crisis or international security challenges? The truth is, the problem is not that there's too little international cooperation. I beg your pardon, the truth is not that there's too much international cooperation, the truth is there's too little. The tragedy of the European Union is not that the management of the euro is over-centralized, it's not centralized enough. The truth about the powers of the UN High Commission on Refugees is not that they have too much power over nation states, they don't have enough power. The truth is about the global economic uh, system. There isn't enough global commitment to trade assistance for those who are displaced by uh, trade deals rather than too much. And so the image of this overmighty international governing system is completely out of kilter with the reality of an interconnected world, which is undergoverned and undermanaged at an international level, not overmanaged to the detriment of the nation state. Very important, but I'm going to move uh, open to the floor to questions in just a second, but one more, which is in that context, one area that uh, in the previous conversation we spoke about a lot is China and the role of China and how that shifts the perspective of the international order. What is your answer to uh, the worldview that says we are in an inexorable struggle with China and that's the absolutely defining you know, thing of our age? Well, I think there are two aspects, two questions, and, uh, and on this I'll have answers as well as uh, <laughs> questions. Uh, the first is a, a real category point because in Mr. Bannon's narrative, China is not just a rising power, it's a power that wants to be a hegemonic power. He compared it to the, um, Germany in the 1930s. He's got an apocalyptic uh, vision of it. And you've got to take a view. Is th do you take that view? Or, in fact, do you think that China is trying to increase its own wealth, its own uh, strength, but for its own purposes, not for global hegemonic purposes? I'm very clear that China does want to see itself at the center of the world, back, if you like, to the days of the Middle Kingdom. But it is not on a path of world domination. Okay. Second and very important point, are we better off trying to include China in the global system or are we better off trying to exclude China and challenge them to build their own system? I'm absolutely clear that the worst thing we could do is incite the Chinese to create their own parallel international system. We want, they're in the United Nations, obviously, they're at the, on the UN Security Council. We want them in the system, not outside uh, the system. And I think it's really but, important but it is, that we But take it that. is true, there is true that that is a, is, is a bet that we have taken for the last 15, 20 years since China joined the WTO in the expectation that China, the hope that China would become more liberal. And it has not. It has become more illiberal, it's become more well, of an there are two aspects to it. One is the question of its liberalism at home, and the second is the question of its adherence to liberal norms uh, abroad. I think in respect of the foreign policy, which includes the trade, we should blame ourselves. When President Obama did his pivot to Asia, which was absolutely the right thing to do, he did it on his own rather than with the European Union. Rather than America and the European Union presenting a united front in negotiations with the Chinese, we've not been sufficiently united. And so I think we, the, 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 the category error, the, the problem has not been the entry of China into the WTO. It's been the question of how it's been handled when it's been in the WTO. I've asked lots of questions. I'm sure there are going to be more from the floor. Yes. Gentlemen here, the second row in the middle. Uh, my question is related to China. Uh, it's not so much that they got into the WTO with um, not a clear path of following our rules, because when you see American companies or European companies going into China, they're forced to leave their technology behind, or when it's not stolen, simply taken away. So how can you 
say that they are playing with our rules when they're actually using our rules to change the system for their own benefit. Well, look, I, I, just to be clear, I think they've used the system as, to the maximum of their own benefit. What they haven't faced is a united front on the other side. And so I think that it's a matter of what's been the power play within the WTO. And so I think you're right to say that, they, of course, they've pushed the boundaries. They've pushed them as far as they'll go on intellectual property and on a whole range of other questions. Uh, the issue is what's been the sanction, what's been the pushback, and the pushback has been divided and fragmented, not united and effective. Next, is there another question? Yes, and then we'll move to here. Yes, one more from the middle there. So um, you talk about how we have to have this pushback against China. Like, why are we opposed to tariffs then if at least in Steve Bannon's view, that those are pushbacks and sanctions against China. Why are we like opposed what, to what? Why are like we opposed to tariffs? What form does that pushback take other than just uh, talking about and criticizing China? Because I think that while in the short term the tariffs are going to hurt the Chinese, in the long term they're going to hurt us more. And we're going but, to suffer. But what would you then do? I think it is an important question because the, the, if we agree that they have not been playing by the rules, and if we agree that the Steve Bannon solution is of... of raising tariffs hurts people here as much as it, uh, more than anything else. What is the right approach? The right approach is to use all the tools that exist within the multilateral system. So what system are those to tools well, if they're not tariffs? Look, every European country and the United States have strategic dialogue with the Chinese in which the Chinese have got asks on the table. They want things. And at the moment, they're getting things because we're fragmented in the way we're negotiating, not united in the way we're negotiating with them. So whether it be on tech, whether it be on R&D, whether it be on inward investment, Across the whole range, we should be using the full tools at our disposal. And remember, the, the point about the Chinese system at the moment is that they are combining the virtues of stability, which they have at greater, to a greater degree uh, than, than, than we do, with the ability to plan for the long term. And we are being cursed by fragmentation and short-termism. And in that contest, of course, they're going to be able to push forward. The next thing you're going to find is that they're making friends across Africa and across Latin America who are going to push back against us as well. But that's part of the retreat. They see, the Chinese see their relationship with the West as a whole, economic, political, cultural. We see it in transactional, fragmented, and short-term as terms, and that's not working. Yes, second row there, gentleman there. Uh, so we talked about econo economic inequality a bit, and uh, Sweden, where I'm from, uh, has, ha has had a very strong welfare state originally, but um, lately inequality has grown the most within all OECD countries within Sweden, and that is not due to a growing gap in wages, but in the growing gap between capital gains and wages not growing enough. And your solution was to have higher minimum wages and also... Um, uh, to have a strong middle-class and middle-class tax subsidies. But what I'm seeing is that you're kind of just kicking the ball down the alleyway when you're doing that. Because of technology, you're going to have a lower, lower access to middle-class middle jobs, to jobs that are not high-technology jobs. So how does a state um, solve a crisis where people are feeling, feeling left out of the economy? You're not going to be able to solve that with the traditional welfare policies that we had in the 50s and 60s. Well, look, I think it's a great... It's a really important point that you're making. I'd say a couple of things. First of all, remember, the, the left out in Sweden are not the 50 or 60 percent that Steve Bannon was claiming for Hungary. The Sweden, I don't want to minimize it, but the Sweden Democrats got 17 percent of the vote in the Swedish uh, elections. The mainstream parties, be they center-right, center-left, green or otherwise, got upwards of 80% uh, of the vote uh, between them. So remember, many people would trade what the Swedes consider to be the challenges that they've got today or the inequalities that they've got today. Secondly, I think Sweden is an example where the speed of the cultural change, not between men and women, but the cultural change associated with immigration has been very, very significant. In, in uh, the last um, 20 years, Sweden has gone from having a very low proportion of foreign-born population to now one of the highest in Europe. And there's no question that's been part of the political argument that's going on there. It's also been badly managed in the sense that there has been very little encouragement to integrate those new immigrants into Swedish society. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, 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 they've got a particular issue to do with the admission of children and then families who, who follow them. I think the third thing which uh, uh, I think you're raising a really important point, which is about access to capital, and it's about the way in which uh, the uh, capital is taxed, but it's also about the way in which business creation takes place and the way people are included 
in the success of their own business. And I think that we've got, uh, I remember even 10 years ago at the time of the financial crisis when I was still in government, the debate about a financial, global financial transactions tax, which you advocate in your um, editorial quite rightly, got stuck on the fact that the US never wanted to buy into a global system and didn't know where the money was going to go. The Europeans got stuck because a couple of European countries didn't want to play into it. I think at a microeconomic level, the issue of how a, I tried to make this point earlier, how a service economy, because that's where most jobs are going to be, how a service economy can deliver middle class wages, not just minimum wages, is an unresolved question. Because if you're not going to upgrade it by um, a negative income tax, then you're going to have to find a way for us, those who are in work, to pay more for the services that we're getting. We've got, oh, I've got more time. I was about to say we've got run out of time, and luckily I've been given more time on the clock. One more question. Yes, lady there, fourth row It would be great to back. have a question about my day job and about refugees and uh, how this country can become a humanitarian leader again. Well, you preemptively struck at that. I actually wanted to go back to your issue on conflict and kind of resolution and diplomacy as a way of resolving conflict and per potentially dealing with migration. I kind of wanted to see your, hear your vision for that because it seems in many cases diplomacy isn't working. Yeah, look, I'm very scarred by the fact that um, you know, we've got 600 people working for the IRC in Syria, we've got 400 people working in Yemen, we've been in Afghanistan since the 1970s and we've got 700 staff still in Afghanistan. And I'm scarred by the fact that they are more under threat as humanitarian workers than they have been before. We're losing more of our workers. Uh, and I'm scarred by the fact that the needs are growing faster than our ability to, uh, to meet them. And that's what makes me think two things. One, the humanitarian system does need to be reformed because refugees are out of their own country for an average of 17 years, because they're in urban areas, not in camps. We've got to change the way we do the response to the symptom of the problem. But then, to your point, secondly, uh, the tools of peacemaking were developed for wars between states. What we're suffering from around the world today, why there are 25 million refugees, is not wars between states, it's wars within states. Syria, Yemen, South Sudan being the best example. Now, the response five or ten years ago to this was to say, look, you've got to recognize that these problems have to be solved locally or regionally. So in the South Sudan example, it was, let's give Africa, uh, the, the East African uh, countries the responsibility of sorting it out. They haven't been able to sort it out. And so my, uh, to the extent that I have a recipe on this, it would be one, you have to internationalize the problem. If the big powers don't care, then you're not going to solve it. Secondly, as Syria shows, if the big powers aren't united, you're certainly not going to uh, solve it. Thirdly, and last point, um, in all of these conflicts, you've got non-state actors as well as state actors. And the extent to which they are inside the system or not, and inside of peace talks or not, this is the issue in Yemen, which is very present in my mind at the moment, um, is absolutely core to whether or not you can deliver the peace. And the reason I raised it is partly that it's a global problem, but also every meeting I do where I talk about the work we're doing and how we can do more, people say, yeah, but how are you going to get to the roots of the problem? And the roots of the problem are in the, in the peacemaking that you, t you draw attention to. I hate to bring this conversation to an end because it could continue for a long time, but we are really out of time now. Uh, we've had from you, I think, a very different perspective. A perspective that says we haven't had enough global cooperation, we haven't had enough cooperation between countries, quite the opposite to Mr. Bannon. A lot of food for thought, and I'm going to now hand over to my colleague Gaddy Epstein, who I hope will go to the other stage there, our media editor, to continue the next conversation. David Miliband, thank you, thank very, you much. very much.